Okay, so thinking back to our first unit, when we first introduced tissues of the body, we learned that there were four principal types of tissue, epithelial, connective, nervous, and muscle, okay? We're gonna talk muscle tissue in this lecture, obviously, because that's the name of the entire lecture. Um, thinking back to the third lecture of the, the semester, when we talked about tissue specifically, we learned that there were three types of tissue, skeletal muscle, which is what was our skeleton that we just got done talking about, which is why we moved from the skeletal system to this system. But also you have cardiac muscle inside your heart and smooth muscle in various internal organs like your stomach, your respiratory bronchial system, the bladder, the tubes that carry urine, and so on and so forth, okay. Um, our muscle tissue as a whole contributes to homeostasis through sustained contraction or alternating contractions and relaxation. And uh, this provides our muscle tissue with four key functions. Now the first two and really the fourth more so relate to skeletal muscle. In fact, the first two, that's strictly skeletal muscle. Body movements involves, you know, things like walking, running, manipulating objects. You know, we're only doing that with our skeletal muscle. Stabilizing positions uh, in our body, kind of the same thing, you know, like maintaining an erect or seated posture against the force of gravity, as well as stabilizing joints like, you know, the neck muscles keeping our head upright. The third function relates to those other two types of, of muscles. Smooth muscle that, like I said, is found in places like our blood vessels, our stomach, our intestines, moving stuff around, you know, whether it's, you know, blood through the blood vessels or blood out of the heart when the heart pumps, and, um, meaning the cardiac muscles involved. Um, you can see I've left uh, several examples here, moving stuff through the digestive tract, sperm and oocytes, which is just another way to say egg cells, through the reproductive system passages, urine through urinary system, lymph through the lymphatic systems. So um, we're moving a lot of stuff thanks to um, those other two types of muscle. The fourth function listed here, the generation of heat, really relates to all three because they're all three going to produce heat. Um, but we have so much more skeletal muscle that it's kind of more important in this um, function. Uh, and that's because, and why this occurs, because of the chemical reactions that take place inside our muscles when they contract. Property known as thermogenesis literally translates to mean heat producing or heat formation. Thermo means heat, genesis means to like create. Um, and this is what we do on cold days. Um, when we shiver to increase our heat production, you know, we can promote the increases in body temperature when our body temperature starts to drop. Okay. Although our bones provide leverage and form the framework of our body, they cannot move body parts by themselves. Motion results from alternating contraction and relaxation and really it should say skeletal muscle here because we're talking about moving bones. Um, skeletal muscle makes up about 40 to 50% of our total adult body weight. Obviously, that's dependent upon um, you know, your lifestyle choices. If you're kind of more of a couch potato, um, you're probably not going to have as much skeletal muscle. You might have more body fat, and that percentage might be different. So this is an average. Okay, so think of it. Not you know, everybody has that perfect 40 to 50 percent, but on average, that's what we have. Um, your muscular strength reflects the primary function of muscle, and this relates to all three types, transforming chemical energy in the form of ATP into mechanical energy to generate force, perform work, produce movement. Okay, the three types of muscle tissue, as we've said, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth, um, are going to share some properties. They'll differ um, from one another in several ways, though. Microscopic anatomy, which we've actually looked at before their location, how they're controlled by the nervous and endocrine systems. We'll look at those kind of things here on the next slide, some of which will be kind of a review from that tissues lecture. Um, all three muscle types uh, do share four special properties enabling the function and contribute to homeostasis. So all four types are excitable, can have contractility uh, and extensibility elasticity. 
Okay. Excitability is a property that we'll see again in our uh, next unit when we talk about the nervous system because neurons also exhibit excitability. And for those of you who are in phys, you should know about that, which is the ability to respond to a stimulus or stimuli by producing electrical signals known as action potentials. Two types of uh, stimuli can signal an action potential in muscle tissue, autorhythmic signals that arise uh, within the muscle tissue itself. Auto actually means self. Um, so that's where that term comes from. That involves the structure known as the pacemaker in our heart, which we'll talk about much later in the semester. When we talk about the heart, uh, when you talk about like um, contracting skeletal muscles, um, we have to excite them. Typically, we're, we're dealing with chemical signals known as neurotransmitters released by neurons like acetylcholine, could even be hormones distributed um, by the blood or even local changes in pH though as well. And I just mentioned that when a uh, muscle cell gets excited, it contracts, which contractility literally is stating, you know, the ability to contract forcefully when stimulated. It's pretty straightforward. The word contract is literally in the word contractility. When a muscle contracts, it generates tension while pulling on its attachment points. If this tension is enough to overcome the resistance of the object to be moved, muscle shortens and movement occurs. And that's really physics related stuff. You know, um, effort has to be greater than resistance. Stuff I'm not gonna really get into. The last two uh, properties here are things we've actually seen before. Back when we talked about skin, we learned that the skin had both of these properties. Unfortunately, they uh, tend to kind of wear out as we get older, leading to, you know, uh, wrinkles and um, you know, skin drooping off the body as we get old. Extensibility, think extend, the ability to stretch or to get longer without being damaged. Obviously, that's within limits. You can't stretch muscles forever and ever and ever. And once again, we're dealing with all three types here. So, you know, the example here, stretch, stretching of the heart, when it fills with blood, stretching of the stomach, when it fills with food, that would be, you know, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle. And then, you know, we've all stretched our skeletal muscles as we, you know, took PE class and that kind of stuff growing up. Uh, think of your muscle like rubber bands that have the ability to stretch like a rubber band, but then when you let go of that rubber band, what happens? snaps back and that's what elasticity is the ability of the muscle tissue to return to its original length and shape after contraction or extension so not only after it is you know pulled and lengthened it can return but even after it shortens it can return to its original length and shape and like if you take a rubber band and you kind of like squeeze it into a ball you let go what's it do it springs back right okay our muscles are very good at doing that Okay, as promised, said we'd talk more about the three types here on this following slide. A lot of the information here is stuff we briefly glossed over in our tissues lecture. The figures on this page should also look pretty familiar to you because those were the three images that we looked at and you had to know for exam one. Okay, let's first talk about skeletal muscle, which is the muscle that we're gonna talk the most about in this unit. It is named because it is attached to our bones or our skeleton, and most of which move our bones. Not all muscle, um, not all skeletal muscle, I should, move, uh, I should say, moves bones, but the majority of them do. Key features is that skeletal muscle is striated. If we look at this, uh, I should call it an illustration, say picture. Uh, microscopic picture kind of looks like it's blurry because of these little lines that you see intermittently in here. Okay, if I zoom even farther, you can kind of see them a little bit better. Okay, these light, dark, light, dark, repeated lines are striations. Striations you can think of as like stripes. Okay, you can only see striations when looked at under a microscope, and as we'll see. Uh, Cardiac muscles also striated. It all has to do with the um, really 
cellular level makeup. We'll get into all that here this morning, learning about where those striations come from. So that's really neat. Scuttle muscle tissue works mainly in a voluntary manner, meaning that its activity can be consciously controlled. And that's because it's regulated by what we call the somatic nervous system, which I don't expect you guys to know. Um, not all of you anyways, the ones of you in FIDS absolutely should know that, which is a division of our nervous system. Uh, we'll talk about the somatic and autonomic nervous systems here in a couple of weeks when we actually talk about the nervous system in this class. Uh, but we purposely mentally control our skeletal muscle for the most part. Some skeletal muscles are also subconsciously controlled to some extent, like your diaphragm, which is going to alternately contract a relaxation, or relax, excuse me, without uh, our conscious control. That's the muscle that allows us to do what? You guys remember? It's what enables us to breathe. Okay? That's the main muscle that contracts allowing us to take an inhale and then it relaxes and lets us exhale. So uh, when we talk about like subconscious control, you know, we don't have to think about mentally be aware of every single breath that we take. We breathe when we're asleep and that's fantastic, but we can override that and take conscious control over our diaphragm, for example, when we want to like hold our breath, something that is beneficial, like when you take a shower or when you jump in a pool, we see a lot of the muscles that run up and down our spine, up in our neck, what we call postural muscles that are also more subconsciously controlled so that we're not putting much you know, mental brain power towards controlling them. Now, uh, skeletal muscle typically we see is attached to bone. There are uh, places like where in our face, it's attached to our skin. And that's why when we you know, contract those muscles, they like let us smile instead of move a joint. Um, they're attached to fascia, and you also see uh, some muscles attached to other muscles. We'll talk about what fascia is here on the next page. Uh, key features of skeletal muscle is that uh, another key feature, I should say, is that it is uh, multinucleated, meaning um, each cell has multiple nuclei. If you look at this uh, picture, you can see like where the number one is in a couple spots. Those are kind of flattened nuclei. And each cell, which you can see here would be one cell, here would be another, has many of them. The nucleus is typically going to be pressed up against the plasma membrane. We'll see a picture that really shows that here in a couple slides. And I've already mentioned that's regulated by the somatic nervous system. Pictured here in our second picture is cardiac muscle tissue found only in the walls of the heart, specifically in what we call the myocardium of our heart. We'll talk more about that here in unit six. Um, as I mentioned, it's harder to kind of see in this picture, but cardiac muscle is striated. Uh, structure that you find in cardiac muscle that you don't find in the other muscle tissues are these bands that you can see, dark lines, which are called intercalated discs. We'll learn about those later on. Uh, Cardiac muscle is uninucleated, so there's only one nucleus per cell, what would be, you know, like most cells of the body. Um, and instead of the nucleus being kind of on the outside of the cell, the nucleus is embedded within the muscle fiber. So it's like in the dead center of the cell. Uh, cardiac muscle and smooth muscles we'll see are typically, especially the heart absolutely is involuntarily controlled. Um, in fact, your heart actually generates its own nerve signaling by way of a uh, group of cells that form what we call our pacemaker. This built-in ability of it, of the heart to initiate its contraction is termed autorhythmicity. Um, and if you left your heart alone, meaning that if it didn't have any outside influence, your heart rate would be a static thing. It would never change. It would be set at a number that never went up or down. But as you guys know, our heart rate can go up and down very, very um, often throughout the day. Um, and that's because of outside influence by way of hormones, neurotransmitters um, that are released from what we call the autonomic nervous system that can either speed it up or slow it down. And uh, pretty neat how that all works. Not a lot of information that I specifically get into in this class, quite like I do in Fizz. Uh, 
Down at the bottom is the picture showing you smooth, which you can see in parentheses down here, it says it's non-striated, um, which is why it's called smooth. Um, so it's not like cardiac and smooth muscle. We'll see why. There's a slide at the very end of this lecture kind of talks about why it doesn't have those striations. Uh, first, we have to learn where striations come from. Uh, we find smooth muscle in the walls of hollow internal structures like our blood vessels, airways, organs like, you know, the stomach, intestines, your bladder, ureters, urethra, etc. Um, the nucleus is located within the muscle cell and is also uninucleated a lot like what we just talked about with cardiac muscle. Usually it's involuntarily controlled. Um, there is examples of smooth muscle that have um, kind of more voluntary or at least some subconscious control, but I won't really get into that. Um, it's uh, relatively slow moving, but fatigue resistant, so it doesn't get as tired as you would see like with skeletal muscle, and it's also regulated by the autonomic nervous system, like our cardiac muscle. Now, for pretty much the rest of this entire unit, although it's only two lectures, um, we're gonna really not so much talk too much about cardiac and smooth muscle, because you know, we'll talk about those types of things when we talk about things like the heart. We have a literal lecture called the heart, where we talk about the heart specifically, and then we'll talk about smooth muscle, when we talk about you know organs like the, the stomach intestines and that kind of stuff there is one last slide that we talk about these two things it's the last slide of this lecture but from really kind of this point on other than that one slide when we're talking skeletal muscle for this unit All right, now thinking back to our first lecture of, or first unit of the semester, I should say, um, we introduced the integumentary system where we talked about the kind of structural makeup of our skin with the epidermis on the outside, the dermis on the inside, or deep to the epidermis. We also talked about the subcutaneous layer, okay? We're gonna start here talking about the subcutaneous layer again because of its relationship between you know, our skin, which we talked about earlier, and now the muscle. Okay, it separates our muscles from skin and is composed of variolar connective tissue and adipose tissue. You should know that by now. Uh, very closely associated with our subcutaneous layer is what we call fascia, fibrous, dense, irregular connective tissue that covers our entire muscles as well as we find it lining our body walls and limbs. There's what we call superficial fascia or fascia, as I've heard it pronounced, and then there's more deep, okay? Here we're gonna talk more about the, the superficial. Function of this fascia is to allow free movement of muscles, support nerves, blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and it helps fill the spaces between our muscles. Okay. Three layers of connective tissue extend from the deep fascia to protect and strengthen our skeletal muscles, okay? And those are the epi, the peri, and the endomycium. Okay, and we say all in the same way. Anytime you see my or my o, that should be a direct indicator that we're talking about muscle. Okay, and we see that kind of in the middle of each of these words. Looking at the picture at the bottom here, we've uh, taken a transverse plane, crossed through the, looks like the brachial radialis muscle, a muscle that we'll talk about um, here in uh, our next lecture. This will be, looks like the humerus. Um, well, we can see some of the things we've talked about previously, like the periosteum and the tendon. And we'll talk about tendons again here in this lecture. 
Surrounding the entire muscle is what we call the epimysium. This is the most superficial. So we're starting in the outside. It is a overcoat of dense irregular connective tissue surrounding and protecting the whole muscle. Deep to it is a thicker layer, that should say layer, not lay, layer of dense irregular connective tissue sheath that wraps muscle fibers, which is just another way to say muscle cells together in bundles called fascicles, which are groups of 10 to 100 individual muscle fibers. Now, what I'm gonna do is, as we go through and learn about these things, um, I'm gonna kind of keep a flow chart to keep our head straight, keep your head straight on kind of the, the organizational makeup of a muscle, okay? There's kind of a, an analogy here that I'll think of or use to kind of describe the organization of a muscle. So you guys um, ever as a kid or uh, remember those, like they kind of look like eggs, but they look like little people where you could open them up and then there was a little, little one inside you open that one up, there was a little one inside. It's kind of the way that our muscles are built, okay? A lot of our muscles are nice and tube-like. So think of them like, you know, um, nice and cylindrical in shape. And you open up those and you find smaller cylinder structures, okay? So if I start just at the highest level, whoops, we gotta flip that. this. There we go. Okay, so at the highest level, that would obviously just be the entire muscle, which is subdivided into structures called fascicles. Oh, camera gonna give me hell here this morning. There we go. Fascicles are known as our bundles of fibers. And I just told you this, but fibers is another way to describe our muscle cells. So surrounding the entire muscle is the epimysium. Surrounding each fascicle is the perimysium. Looking at this illustration here, we have our entire muscle. You can see we've kind of peeled away the epimysium to show it surrounding the entire thing. We can see inside of that muscle, since we've cut it open, are these cylindrical bundles. We've pulled one out. This is one of those fascicles, and that's surrounded by the perimysium. Okay. Looking at this portion of the picture, what we've done is we've just zoomed in at this singular fascicle. You can see bracket off here is the fascicle. And a fascicle is made up of a bundle of what we call muscle fibers, each of which is surrounded by what we call an endomysium. Okay. So epi surrounds the whole muscle, peri surrounds the fascicles, the endo, which is a thin sleeve of irregular connective tissue surrounds each muscle fiber. Once again, muscle fiber is just another way to say muscle cell, okay. Now, the epi, the peri, and the endomysium are all continuous with connective tissues that attach skeletal muscles to other structures such as bone or in some cases another muscle. So that tendon that you can see there in the picture is you know just like the tendons we learned about last unit, a fibrous cord of dense regular connective tissue attaching muscle to the periosteum, that outer membrane of our bones. Okay. Something new are tendon sheaths. Tendon sheaths enclose certain tendons, like at the wrist and ankle, where we have a lot of tendons coming together in a confined space. Function of those is to decrease the friction placed on the tendons within a with with a synovial membrane. And yes. You know, we just recently talked about synovial joints, synovial membranes. That's a national tomato rule. They're testing it everywhere. Uh, okay. uh -huh. Sorry. 
uh, synovial membrane, like the membrane that we talked about last week, creates the synovial fluid, you know, like between our bones and synovial joints to lubricate. Okay? Same thing seen here. The inner layer of a tendon sheath is known as a visceral layer. It's attached to the inner surface of the tendon. The outer layer is the parietal layer and is attached to the bone. Between the two layers is a cavity with the synovial fluid to reduce the friction as the tendons slide back and forth. Okay. Like a tendon is what we call an aponeurosis, which is more like a flattened tendon. Instead of being more like a kind of cylindrical cord, it's more of a, like a broad flat sheet, uh, generally merging with the fibrous wrappings of a muscle. We'll see those, you know, examples of those and we'll see examples of tendon sheaths here in our next lecture, uh, like the epicranial aponeurosis, which is on top of our skull and um, is just beneath the, the, the scalp skin. Now, our skeletal muscles have to be well supplied with both nerves and blood vessels because the nerves are going to help innervate and tr uh, trigger them to contract. Muscles provide them with the nutrients that they require and help remove the waste that they produce. Generally, an artery and one or two veins accompany each nerve that penetrates a skeletal muscle. Uh, as I told you earlier, skeletal muscles innervated by the somatic motor, uh, nervous system, so somatic motor neurons are the ones that innervate our skeletal muscle fibers. Here we can see in yellow in the illustration is one of those. Each of those somatic motor neurons has thread-like axons extending from the brain or spinal cord to a group of skeletal muscle fibers. Um, so more than likely this branch here has also got, you know, branches connected to it in each of these muscle fibers. A singular motor neuron plus all the fibers that it innervates is what's called a motor unit. Can be as few as 20 or as many as a thousand muscle fibers, depending on what kind of control we need. Um, the point where a nerve uh, fiber meets a muscle is known as a neuromuscular junction. Uh, a lot of this information I'm gonna just, I'm just kind of breezing through. It's more kind of physiology based stuff. And we haven't talked about the nervous system yet. So I'll uh, jump down to the last bullet where we talk about blood flow. So. Let's do that now. Microscopic blood capillaries are plentiful in muscle tissue with each muscle fiber being in close contact with one or more capillaries. Uh, muscle fibers use huge amounts of energy requiring a continuous supply of oxygen and nutrients from our arteries. Muscle cells also give off large amounts of metabolic waste in, including like carbon dioxide, creatinine and whatnot that must be removed via veins. Uh, capillaries within our muscle have to be long and winding to accommodate uh, changes in muscle length. As far as the picture goes, I do want you to know some of the things in it. So I'll kind of start here at the top right and work down, beginning with the tendon. That should be pretty easy to identify. Then I want you to identify the paramyceum, the epimyceum, the fascicle that's been um, kind of pulled out, paramyceum that surrounds it, the muscle fiber, now over here on the left side, go ahead and highlight the fascicle. If I put this picture on the exam, more than likely I would you know, include that this is the fascicle, so I'd leave this there. But just in case, make sure you know it. Okay, back over here on the right, the endomyceum, paramyceum that's surrounding that fascicle, endomyceum again that's surrounding this individual fiber that's been pulled out. Speaking of fiber, go ahead and highlight that. And then highlight myofibril and filament because those are going to go into our flow chart, which I'll add here after you guys get into this slide. 
Okay, so on this slide, we're going to talk about skeletal muscle fibers, which, as it says here, are the most important component of a skeletal muscle. Um, the diameter of a mature skeletal muscle fiber can range from 10 to 100 microns. Uh, what's neat is the number of skeletal muscle fibers that we have is set before we're born. Remember, fibers are the same thing as cells. So thinking about our muscles when we're a baby, they're small, right? They obviously much smaller than when we are as adults. In order for our muscles to grow, we don't divide muscle cells to increase size. That's how most organs grow, like our bones that we just recently talked about with that epiphyseal plate and where cell division takes place, causing bones to grow in length. Okay. In order for muscles to grow in size, muscle fibers must grow in diameter, so they just expand. That property is called hypertrophy, okay, which is unique to muscle fibers, not completely unique because we see it in other places. Most tissues in our body, like our bones, that, like I was saying, or the skin that we've recently talked about, grow due to what's called hyperplasia, which is through cell division. Now, hypertrophy is stimulated by hormones like growth hormone and testosterone. Um, both um, genders secrete those um, hormones, especially when we hit puberty. Men typically produce more testosterone, which explains why men generally have bigger muscles. Um, the opposite of hypertrophy is called atrophy, which is where muscle fibers will shrink, thus causing the entire muscle to shrink. Something that happens if you don't really stress your muscles enough, um, or if you like have to spend time with like a, a limb and a, a cast. I remember I spent uh, almost six months in a cast when I broke my wrist when I was in high school and when that cast came off, it looked like my left arm was just skin and bones because all those muscles had kind of, you know, almost kind of like wilted away. Fortunately, you know, a couple of weeks go by that um, hypertrophy kind of comes back pretty easily when you stress the muscle. Muscle is, and bones is kind of the same way, a use it or lose it type tissue where the more you stress it, the more, you know, it's going to strengthen. Okay, let's talk about the development of those skeletal muscle fibers all the way back to embryonic stages of life. Um, the original cells that uh, form our skeletal muscle fibers are known as myoblasts, which we can actually show a few of them. They merge together, forming that immature muscle fiber seen here, each of which still contains, or is, how do I say that? Um, that immature muscle fiber contains each of those original nuclei from those myoblasts, which explains why muscle fibers, like the one shown here, have multiple nuclei, or, and we describe them as being multinucleated. Okay. Um, also seen in that picture are, uh, or is one of our satellite cells right there, uh, which are supporting cells that can help increase the number of nuclei in our mature muscle fibers. Not that I'm really going to focus too much on those cells. So we're focusing in on the muscle cells, the muscle fibers. Okay. Now, a few weeks ago, you guys learned about all the organelles found in our cells, like you know, the plasma membrane, mitochondria, nucleus that we've mentioned already this morning. Our muscle fibers have most of those same organelles. The Unfortunate situation is that some of those organelles in our muscle cells have a different name. It's the same organelle, they just kind of change their name a little bit. A lot of it begins with sarco, like sarcolemma, which is the fancy term for the plasma membrane of a muscle cell, shown down here in our picture in blue. And just beneath that sarcolemma is where you'd find those multiple nuclei I just mentioned. Okay. Like neurons and the, the plasma membrane of a neuron, it can be stimulated, ultimately resulting in an action potential. Remember we talked about excitability on that first slide. When an uh, action potential is generated in the sarcolemma, it's going to spread throughout the sarcolemma, kind of like a wave in the ocean. But what we need is that action potential to spread inward 
to the middle part of the cell or the middle part of the fiber. And that's possible because you can see these little blue tube-like structures that are connected to the plasma membrane. We call those T-tubes for short, uh, or transverse tubules. Tiny imaginations of the sarcolemma tunneling in from the surface toward the center of each muscle fiber. And I've already told you this, but their function is to conduct impulses, which is the same thing as action potentials from the sarcolemma down into the cell to ensure that an AP, action potential, excites all parts of the muscle fiber at essentially the same instant. Within the sarcolemma is what we call the sarcoplasm, which is just a fancy term for the cytoplasm of a muscle fiber. Where the cytoplasm was the gel-like fluid plus the organelles that it suspends. Um, in our muscle fibers, it contains a, a substantial amount of stored glycogen, which is uh, the stored form of glucose, what we use to make most of our ATP, ATP being the energy um, that our muscle fibers need to contract. There's also a red colored protein called myoglobin, which binds oxygen molecules so oxygen can be released for ATP production. Myoglobin, I always say, is kind of like hemoglobin's cousin, which you've probably heard of before. I doubt many of you have actually heard of myoglobin, but I bet a lot of you have heard of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the protein within our blood, specifically our red blood cells, that helps transport oxygen. And actually, when that oxygen binds to hemoglobin, it turns the red blood cells really nice and bright red, which explains where the color of your blood comes from. Okay. Myoglobin is going to cause your muscle cells to appear red and actually is responsible for that red colored fluid that will leak out of a steak that's only been cooked to like medium rare. A lot of people think that a medium rare steak is full of blood. Okay? That is not blood that you see leaking out of your steak. Okay? One of the first things they do to a butchered animal is drain the blood from the animal and let most or you know all that blood get out of the the, the cow or whatever it is you're you know butchering. So myoglobin is essentially responsible for that red color that looks like blood. What it is is really just kind of like red water that's leaking out of the steak. So don't ever feel like you can't you know eat a bloody, as they call it, a medium rare steak, which is absolutely the most delicious form of steak, in my opinion. Uh, let's talk now about myofibrils, which were one of the things that I went ahead and had you guys highlight on that previous page. They are thread-like structures that have a contractile function found inside muscle fiber cells, run parallel to one another and extend the entire length of the cell. And it's there we find the prominent striations that make the entire skeletal muscle fiber appear striated. Okay. Looking here in our picture, we can see there are many of these kind of tube-like structures, each of which is a myofibril. Okay. So I can bounce back to my kind of flow chart here and add them to the list. And I usually just describe them as simply just our contractile organelles. They are what shorten or contract, causing the muscle fiber to shorten, causing the fascicles to shorten, ultimately causing our muscles to shorten. Myofibrils are subdivided into what are called sarcomeres, which inside of a sarcomere are where you find what we call our filaments, just sometimes see listed as myofilaments. And actually here in our picture, we can see one of the sarcomeres of this mild fiber labeled. And inside of that sarcomere, we can see what we call the thick and thin filament. We'll talk about all that stuff here on the next page. Okay. 
Last organelle to talk about is the SR, short for sarcoplasmic reticulum, a fluid-filled system of membranous sacs. This is the exact same thing as what we learned earlier in the semester as the SCR, smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Okay. Uh, the function of, and it's this gold colored stuff in the picture, the function of the SR is to store calcium and release it at the right time because calcium is a essential thing for a muscle to contract. Okay. What happens is, and you can see on both sides of a two tube, we find what we call terminal cisterns, okay. these fattened sacs of the SR. When an action potential travels in to the center of the muscle fiber, it triggers the opening of certain channels that are found in those terminal cisterns causing the release of calcium and the calcium then is going to uh, alter things going on with the thin filament, thus enabling the entire fiber to contract. Okay. Now you can see labeled down here in the bottom left is what's called a triad. Okay. Tri we know by now, hopefully, and this was something you probably knew before class, it means three. Okay. In this case, it's three structures a T-tube in the middle, and then on both sides are the terminal cisterns. So two terminal cisterns and a T-tube make up what's called the triad. And as I said, main function of the SR is to store calcium ions, which can be released triggering muscle contraction. SR also contains pumps for calcium, so calcium can be pumped back into the SR. Uh, after a muscle contracts so that there's always low concentrations of uh, calcium in the sarcoplasm compared to the SR. Uh, the other channels in the SR, those calcium channels that open to release it, we literally call those calcium release channels. And uh, that's stuff I don't really get into in this class. All right. Letter C here, this picture, not A or B, would be the one I want you to know. Um, I would say everything in this picture will be fair game for the exam, so make sure you know it. Things that we haven't quite talked about yet, I did mention, would be the thick filament, thin filament, sarcomere, and a Z-disc. Let's talk about those here on this next page. All right, within myofibrils are smaller structures called filaments. Two major ones are the thin filament and the thick filament, named because the thin filament, which is eight nanometers in diameter, is half as wide as the thick filament, which is 16 nanometers in diameter. Both of them are about the same length, one to two microns. Uh, we show them here in these pictures at the bottom as kind of a thinner line and then a thicker line. Or in this picture, this is the yellow substance and the much thicker red would be the thick filament. Okay. Um, these are the structures that are actually involved with the contractile process. Uh, I'll kind of explain how that all works on the next slide. Looking at the picture at the bottom here, we show one what we call sarcomere. Okay, sarcomere is the basic functional unit of a myofibril, and that's where those filaments are contained. Looking at the picture, we see there are point, points within the sarcomere where there is an overlap between the filaments. There's points where there's not the thick filament, only the thin filament, and there's points 
where there's only the thick filament. The amount of overlap within a sarcomere is dependent upon whether that muscle is in a contracted, relaxed, or stretched state. And I'll show you a picture on the next page that shows really what happens when a muscle goes from more of a relaxed to a more contracted state. Okay. Filaments inside a myofibril do not extend the entire length of the muscle fiber. Instead, they're arranged in these compartments called sarcomeres. Okay. So I'm actually gonna list off here. Sarcomeres are the functional units of a myofibril. And I'm going to do my best at kind of drawing a myofibril. So here's our myofibril, kind of the tube-like structure. I'm doing my best to make it a three-dimensional picture. Okay. A sarcomere is a segment of a myofibril. So by going from here to here, that's what a sarcomere is. Okay. This will be another sarcomere. This will be another. So myofibrils have many, many, many shortened segments. Each of those short segments is a sarcomere. Okay. Let's talk about the structural makeup of a sarcomere. Uh, each border of a sarcomere is defined by what we call Z-discs, uh, which we see here at the bottom. We also saw one labeled here in the previous picture. These are composed of dense protein material serving as a point of attachment for the thin filaments. Notice the thin filaments directly connected to the zigzag line. That is Z-disc. You think zigzag pretty easy zigzag both those words you know begin the letter z connected to that zigzag line is the thin filament okay all right let's talk about the bands the a band the i band are uh points within each sarcomere uh i'm gonna start with let's just talk about the i band first the i band uh, is actually going to span across two different sarcomeres so half of a sarcomere and half um, the neighboring sarcomere. In the center of the I-band is Z-disc. And this is the point within a sarcomere where there's only the thin filament, okay? Not thick filament, only the thin, okay? This is what looks light in those striations. Those are the lighter colored striations in our pictures. And it's nice because what letters in the word light? I, right? Okay. The darker striations are a result of what's called the A band, which spans from one side of the thick filament to the other side of the thick filament. And what's nice about the word dark is the letter A is in that word. I don't know if that's where I band, A band comes from, but it just happens to work out perfectly. Now the A band is divided into three zones. Two, what we call zones of overlap, which is exactly what it sounds like, a point of the A-band where the thick and thin filaments overlap one another. And then the H zone, which is where there's only thick filament. Okay? At the middle of the H zone is the M line. And so the M line happens to be the perfect middle part of the sarcomere and M for middle is a pretty easy way to remember it. It contains supporting proteins that hold the thick filaments together at the center of the H zone. Now, sometimes you'll see the H zone as what's called the H band. Um, here we have it listed as H zone, so that's you know what I would definitely want you to know it as. Pattern of the thick and thin filament overlap consisting of zones and bands creates those striations that can be seen in single myofibrils and in the whole muscle fibers. Okay. Now, this kind of combo illustration here, the kind of more three-dimensional and the kind of two-dimensional version, I'm telling you right now, you're gonna need to know it. This will be on the exam next week. There's your you know, freebie for the day. Everything would be fair game. 
for the exam. So put a big old fat star on it. Now, notice here in the illustrations, there's a couple things I've omitted underneath or behind the thin filament in parentheses. We have the word actin. Behind thick filament, we have the word myosin, which relate to two proteins that we're going to talk about here on the next page. And something I didn't talk about yet, but we'll also talk about on the next page, is what we call the titan filament. Titan protein. So let's do that now. Okay, let's talk about the three kinds of proteins that are uh, going to form or be found within our myofibrils. Actin and myosin, which you saw in parentheses on the previous page, are the two contractile. Then you've got some regulatory proteins, tropomyosin and troponin, and then a few structural proteins. All right, we'll start with the two contractile proteins, actin and myosin, which do exactly what it sounds like. They generate the force during contraction. So the ones that are actually doing the contracting. Myosin is a motor protein found in all three types of muscle tissue, so not just skeletal muscle. Uh, and this is a protein that pushes or pulls various cellular structures, achieving movement by converting the chemical energy in ATP to mechanical energy of motion. They are the only protein that forms a thick filament, okay? About 300 myosin molecules form one singular thick filament. Here we can see one thick filament and one part, at least, of a myosin molecule, okay? A myosin molecule is kind of like uh, a two-headed golf club where the shaft of the two golf clubs are kind of wrapped around each other. And then the heads, which is, you know, like what you would hit the golf ball with, are not shown very well here, but they point off at about 60 degrees from one another, okay? Now, unlike a golf club, which is nice and rigid, and the, the, the point where the kind of shaft meets the head is, you know, structurally not going to move. This is more like a hinge where these can flex kind of like what you can do with your wrist. Okay. You know, if these heads can go like this, they can swivel. Okay. Based on, you know, energy and the release of that energy. Okay. Speaking of energy, energy binds to a portion of the myosin head at what we call its ATP binding site and enables it to go into this kind of cocked position after it's bound to actin at what we call its actin binding site. Okay, We'll see each actin has a myosin binding site where those two meet, forming what's called a cross bridge. Okay? When an actin molecule and a myosin molecule meet, forming a cross bridge, ATP is released. And what this does is it allows the myosin head to kind of pull the actin and thus ends up causing the thin filaments to get pulled towards the M line of the sarcomere. In fact, here, if we look on the, the right side of the page, I've got a picture with two sarcomeres. This would be one, this would be the next door neighbor. We've labeled the H zone where there's only thick filament, the I band where there's only thin, the A band where there's the thick filament. Okay. What happens when we go from relaxed to partially contracted to maximally contracted is look at the Z-discs with those thin filaments. They're going to get pulled towards that M line. And the, what's going to happen is the I band is going to shrink okay? because the Z-discs are going to get pulled closer and closer together. And the zone of overlap, which is not labeled, but it's here right in the middle, ends up becoming the entire sarcomere because the entire sarcomere is, you know, where there's thick and thin filaments overlapping. 
those thick filaments pull the thin filaments toward the center of the muscle fiber, or excuse me, to the center of the sarcomere. Now, one singular thick filament is made up of about 300 of these guys, okay, where you've got some running in one direction, some running in the other direction. Right here where they meet in the middle is that M line that we've mentioned, shown here, kind of looks like a blue chain. Okay. Now, keep in mind, each of those myosin molecules has two heads, and you have to three, three dimensionally, each of those heads basically is projecting outward in a nice 360 degree way, which is handy because if I go back to this picture, I'm gonna zoom in right over here, we can see the end of the, the, the myofibril. Each of these kind of bigger red circles is a thick filament. We see the little yellow dots would be a thin filament and each red dot, it's not shown perfectly, would be surrounded by six thin filaments every 60 degrees. And thus, each of those myosin heads has a great spot to grab a hold of an actin molecule, or an actin. So let's talk about actin now. Actin is the main component of the thin filament. It's not the only component, okay? But it is the main component, okay? There's kind of two forms of actin. I shouldn't say kind of, there are two forms of actin. Think of actin as a whole like a beaded necklace. In fact, it's more like two beaded necklaces that are kind of wrapped around each other in a helix shape. That's what F actin is. But a beaded necklace is made up of individual beads. Each bead is like a G actin. G is for globular, F is for filament not something I'm going to ask you to know. But notice each of those little uh, beads has a myosin binding site. That's where the thick filament head, the myosin heads, would grab hold and form that cross bridge. Now, actin is not the only component of the thin filament. Two regulatory proteins, tropomyosin and troponin, also help to form the thin filament. Troponin, kind of shown here with the three blue dots, is where that calcium that I was talking about will bind. And that triggers the movement of what's called tropomyosin off of the myosin binding sites. Notice here, this would be a relaxed thin filament. There's no calcium bound to the troponin. But more importantly, that rope-like tropomyosin is covering those binding sites. And that's gonna prevent those myosin heads from attaching to the thin filament, which will prevent the muscle from contracting. So we call these troponin and tropomyosin regulatory proteins because they can help switch the contraction process on and off. And last type of protein are called structural proteins, which help keep the thick and thin filaments in the proper alignment, give the myofibril elasticity, extensibility, and leak myofibrils to the sarcoloma and extracellular matrix. So they provide structure. Okay. And the first one, the third most plentiful protein in our skeletal muscles, let me get third after actin myosin, is titan, which gets its name because it's really big and is the only other protein that's in that picture on the previous page. It stabilizes the position of myosin by spanning from a Z disc all the way to the M line. And I would highlight that this is what accounts for much of the elasticity and extensibility of myofibrils which enables it to stretch and recoil as we've already learned. Dystrophin links thin filaments of the sarcomere to integral membrane proteins in the sarcolemma. I imagine most of you have heard of the uh, disease muscular dystrophy. Okay. Uh, see the dystrophy and dystrophin words sound very similar. The most um, common form of muscular dystrophy involves uh, a genetic inability to produce this protein or it results in kind of a, a faulty form of dystrophin and thus um, over time the muscles become weak and essentially stop working correctly and uh, can be fatal um, unfortunately and really there's no way to prevent it because it's genetic um, most of the time the person doesn't even know it until it's too late Nebulin is the third uh, 
structural protein wraps around the entire length of each thin filament, helping to anchor the thin filaments to Z disks. Now, looking at the illustration over here on the right, one thing I, I said was, you know, the I band shrinks, so does the H zone, which once again, this H zone is where there's only thick filament. Notice what doesn't change in length is shown here in pink, the A band, okay? What does not change when a muscle goes from a relaxed to partially to maximally contracted is the length of the filaments, okay? The circumere shortens for sure, okay? The amount of overlap is what changes. So, you know, let me take one second here and I'm gonna pull my camera up on me so you can see me out there in Zoom land. I always use my arms to kind of mimic what's taking place. Okay, so if we pretend, you know, that my left arm is the thin filament, my right arm is the thick filament, okay? My elbows are like the Z-disc. So when a circumere shortens, Okay, the thick and thin filaments slide over one another. Okay, the filaments don't change their length, like my arms haven't changed length. Okay, we call a muscle contraction, or the process involved in a muscle contraction, the sliding filament theory for that reason. The filaments slide over one another, but they don't change their length. Make sense? Clear as mud, right? Now, the table here on the next page is kind of like what I was just doing on the, the separate piece of paper, going through it, uh, giving you the levels of organization. I kind of did it at the time, just kind of keep your head straight. Um, this table's a little nicer, neater than my handwritten one. The one thing missing, they didn't include as kind of a separate category as a sarcomere, and that's because the sarcomere is not, not like a structure, it's a, it's a segment of a myofibril, uh, so you can see why that is uh, on this page. Okay, our last slide here, we're gonna jump back and talk a little bit more about our cardiac and smooth muscle again. This will be the last time we talk about them in this unit. All right, let's talk cardiac muscle first. Cardiac muscle fibers have the same arrangement of actin and myosin, same bands, same zones, Z discs that we just talked about that our skeletal muscles have. Okay, and that's why cardiac muscle has striations like skeletal muscle. Okay, I mentioned earlier that cardiac muscle has what are called intercalated discs, and it's unique to cardiac muscle fibers. These are Irregular transverse thickenings of the sarcolemma. Once again, that's the plasma membrane that connects the ends of muscle fibers with one another. Okay. Within an intercalated disc are what we call gap junctions, which are special openings that allow for action potentials to spread from one muscle fiber to another. We don't see gap junctions in skeletal muscle. Some of our smooth muscle fibers will have gap junctions, but basically they are doorways to allow a nerve signal to spread from cell to cell to something super, super important, especially in our heart, enabling our heart to beat in a very efficient and coordinated manner. Stuff I don't really get too much into detail about in this class. Cardiac muscle tissue has an endo in a perimyceum, but lacks an epimyceum. Uh, when stimulated by an action potential, cardiac muscle tissue remains contracted 10 to 15 times longer than skeletal muscle tissue because of prolonged calcium release uh, and delivery in the sarcoplasm. 
Mitochondria and cardiac muscle fibers are larger and more numerous, suggesting that cardiac muscle fibers prefer to make ATP aerobically, which means that they use oxygen uh, to make their ATP. And uh, like skeletal muscle fibers, uh, cardiac muscle fibers can undergo hypertrophy, which is where they increase in size due to increased workload, which explains why many athletes have enlarged hearts, especially like endurance runners, cyclists, that kind of stuff. They call those athletes hearts. Okay, two forms of uh, smooth muscle fibers exist, what we call visceral or single unit and multi-unit, shown in our kind of middle pictures here, A and B. Uh, visceral is the more common type found in the skin, tubular arrangements that form parts of the wall and small arteries and veins, as well as hollow organs, such as the stomach, intestine, the ureters, and bladder. Uh, they're like our cardiac muscle in that uh, each cell is not innervated directly by a neuron, but they're connected to one another by a gap junction. So what that means is an action potential will travel to the to the neuron or the, the cell, excuse me, that's directly connected to that neuron. And then that action potential can spread from cell to cell because of the gap junctions. Okay. Whereas multi-unit, you can see each cell has a direct connection to an autonomic neuron. Okay. Um, multi-unit we find uh, in our larger arteries, airways to the lungs, the rectal pili muscle. Remember that's the one causes goosebumps, muscles of the iris that adjust the pupil diameter in our eyes, and the ciliary body that adjusts the focus of the lens in our eyes for near or far vision. Over on the right, we show uh, the microscopic anatomy of a relaxed and then a contracted uh, smooth muscle fiber. Um, structurally, they are um, in a relaxed state, 30 to 200 microns in length. Circumplasm contains smooth muscle with both thick and thin filaments. So we still see thick filaments with myosin, the thin filaments with actin and the others, but they're not arranged orderly into circumeres as we say in cardiac muscle or in skeletal muscle. So that's why they don't have the striations. They also have what are called intermediate filaments, which I won't even really get into. Um, as far as the, the pictures at the bottom of, you know, not something I'm going to ask you to know, just the information that was just there at the top. Any questions?